All right, we are thrilled to have our long-term friend Simon Hill back on the show today to discuss his new and exciting book, The Proof is in the Plants. Welcome, Simon. Thank you, Elsa. Thank you, Jeff. Always a pleasure to, to be back with you guys and uh, looking forward to round two. Yeah, absolutely. Actually, I love the uh, the title. I mean, one of my favourite sayings is the proof is in the pudding, but maybe we'll have to put yeah. that the proof is in the plant-based pudding. But um, <laughs> it's, it's a, it, there's a lot of questions that we want to get into with the book. But for those that aren't familiar with you, Simon, I wanted to start with a little bit about yourself, um, you know, who you are, who you were growing up, uh, what, what sort of defined you, what sort of channeled you into becoming the person that you are today. So do you want to start with um, sort of where you grew up and, and sort of what your early years uh, were like? Yeah, sure. So I guess today people see me as someone who's talking about nutrition science and I've done a master's in nutrition. What sort of led me to that was very much uh, a, a pivotal moment in my life when I was 15 years old. So I grew up in, in Melbourne. And uh, with my family, we spent a few years in America and, and then we came back to, to Melbourne where I did my, the rest of my primary school and my secondary school. And when I was 15, my dad and I were, were heading out through the Yarra Valley. You may, you may be familiar with that. It's a wine mm. district. Uh, lovely, yeah. Sort of in the country region of, of Victoria outskirts of Melbourne, really lovely area, rolling hills, beautiful wineries. And these were some of my fondest memories, just spending these weekends exploring the area with my dad and my brother would often be there with us too. On this, on this one Sunday in particular, we were driving home and I can remember it, I can, I can remember this quite vividly. It was it was dusk, and so the, the sun was setting. It was it was an incredible day. My dad always liked to go to the smaller vineyards, and it wasn't so much about drinking the wine. It was more about just spending time together. But also at the smaller vineyards, you could really you could connect with with usually the owner or the winemaker, and you could sort of feel how how much passion they had for their trade. So I think there was a bit of a lesson in that. Uh, on this one particular day, we were driving home, and my dad, who is a doctor, he started to develop chest pain. And he played it down a little bit and, and sort of went into that state of denial, which is quite common. And we proceeded to to go home we had a we had a second house in the country in an area called king lake and that's where he and i were staying that that night so we we got home and he continued to to say he was okay and downplay it and reassure me that it was okay and i was 15 so i wasn't really to know any better we had dinner and then i headed off to bed and i heard some cluttering around in the early hours of the morning loud enough to to wake me up and it was quite unusual to hear that so i headed out to the living room in the back of my mind knowing what had happened hours earlier and that my dad may have been in need of some assistance and when i got out there clearly he was not doing great he was you know bent over out of breath uh you know in need of of assistance assistance that i definitely couldn't provide as a 15 year old i really didn't know what was happening and he he knew absolutely what was happening and had called triple o and handed the phone to to me and i described what was happening to the the paramedic on the on the end of the phone and they said to me look based on the symptoms you're describing we need to send a helicopter to to come to collect your dad and take him to the nearest hospital as soon as possible and and that was because where we were was quite remote and obviously with the symptoms i was describing they saw that as an a, 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 an emergency and so they did come and and they scooped him up off the floor and put him onto a stretcher and attached all of you know these different cables to him heart rate monitor and oxygen and things like that and it's all happening at a million miles an hour so there was a lot of fear and a lot of unknown uh, and i was there by myself with him so my, my mother and my brother were actually at our place in melbourne in the city so 
they they took him in a helicopter. I couldn't fit into the, in the helicopter. Uh, he was only forty one as well while this was wow. happening, uh, which is not too much older than I am today. And I trailed in an ambulance behind going to the hospital and had called my mother and my brother and and told them what was happening and everyone was quite scared. And we we ended up getting to the hospital and the the doctor came out and spoke to us and he said look we've we've stabilized your dad he was having a a serious cardiac arrest heart attack Mm. um and he will he'll be okay he will be on medications for the rest of his life but he'll be okay and he survived we've taken his history and your grandfather also had a heart attack at a quite a young age as well and so you and your brother he was speaking to, to to my brother as well at this stage will need to be screened as you're getting older and, and keep an eye on this because this type of disease runs in families and so at that stage the the seed was planted for me that potentially my fate would be very similar to my father and, and here he was at 41 with you know for all intents and purposes was a fairly healthy looking guy on the exterior mm. he was 41 he had two young kids look probably like many dads in australia working very hard and carrying a little bit of stress and you know having <laughs> to look after two two uh young boys is a hard task in itself let alone also the full-time job and uh you know being being a husband and and whatnot so uh that that for me for many years left a sort of limiting belief in that I'd been dealt a genetic card that would determine my health fate one day and it wasn't until over a decade later where I'd started to to jump into nutrition science and and really dive deep into understanding what do we know about eating for health What do we know about eating to prevent disease? And it became clear to me that we have much more power than often we're led to believe and that a number of these diseases we've very much normalized in our society, cardiovascular disease being the leading cause of death in Australia, but also type two diabetes and and various types of cancer and, and even cognitive decline. We've accepted them as a normal part of aging and, and in reality, we have much more control over whether these do affect us and whether they affect us as early uh, or, or much later in our life, hopefully. And so when I think back to that conversation with the doctor who, who explained that these run in families, now I understand that by and large, yes, there are there are certain people who have been dealt a very unfortunate genetic card and no matter what they do they will have poor health and that's very sad and that's 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 not fair and that does happen but that's a very small percentage of people and by and large for most of us the reason these diseases are running in our families and are affecting our community is because we're adopting the same lifestyles and so discovering that information then became very empowering and it fueled me to want to look deeper into nutrition science and and really take control of my own health first and foremost and then with that information i i began you know spreading the information through the community online and and ultimately putting it all into a book so with your father obviously 41 that's young to have a heart attack i mean obviously there are genetic um predisposition to that but you said he was reasonably healthy on the outside um i I take that he was probably the average australian male the the sad diet the standard american standard australian diet which was predominantly meat two veg um you know a bit of processed food a bit of alcohol Um, was there any extremes in there or is that was he pretty much well down the average average yeah, that's that's a very accurate reflection. You know, maybe slightly overweight, but but not not ridiculously overweight by any means. But as you say, a diet where animal protein was definitely the hero of the plate, 
and the, the sort of plant protein and fiber was kind of an afterthought and, and probably not too much ultra processed foods to be fair. Mm. I think my brother and I as children, we probably had more ultra processed foods right. and, and more sort of celebrations at McDonald's and things after sport. But my dad tended to, to consume more, more whole foods than us but definitely the hero of the plate was always the animal protein. Mm. Right. So in terms of your father now, is, is, he, is he a convert? Is he uh, a vegan-based? I mean, oftentimes I laugh because even, um, you know, a, a, a prophet is without honour in their hometown is the old saying. Um, but, you know, with the research that you've done now that you're an author, obviously you're celebrated within the vegan community of putting forward very strong health, um, you know, it claims and science to back that up. Do, does, does your dad listen to you? Yes, he does. And I, I think I should clarify that. And, and even in the book, I don't, I don't make the claim that the vegan diet is the single optimal diet. I think there's a set of characteristics mm -hmm. and a plant-based diet actually in the literature can include modest amounts of animal products. Yep. And, and we see that in, in whether it's the Mediterranean diet or the DASH diet or pescatarian diets or vegetarian diets or vegan diets, all of these can actually be done in a way that is heart healthy. Yeah. So I would say what I say to everyone is actually not to look at my, my diet, but to find the level of commitment that works for them. Because ultimately what, what we want is the changes that someone makes uh, to become life lasting, not something they do for two or three weeks and they can't sustain. Mm. Yeah. There's no point in doing that. And that was really important to me when I wrote the book. There's enough books out there that are focused on the two, the three week, the quick fix. And what I want people to realize is rather than focusing on this perfect goal, the perfect diet that you're unlikely to adhere to, really find that level of commitment that's right for you based on your personal circumstances. So I would say with my dad, he has certainly moved to a plant-based approach and probably 85% of his calories will be coming from whole plants. And then there's much mod much more modest amounts of, of animal protein in there. You've got a beautiful saying in your book, which you say, don't let perfection be the enemy of good. It's like mm -hmm. I say, uh, progress, not perfection, which is obviously the same thing. And I think this is a problem when a lot of people start something, especially if they're you know novice and an acolyte to it, uh, an acolyte to it is that, um, they set the bar so high mm -hmm. that if they fail, the whole wall caves down. And it's just mm -hmm. like, uh, I can't do this. I'm not good enough. This is not sustainable. Whereas you say, no, no. And it's the same with, ex I know you say the same thing with exercise as well too. You know, and, and actually there's a lot of research coming out that's showing that um, uh, a little bit of something is actually exponentially better than setting this unrealistic goal that then it just kicks to the curb. Small amounts, small changes can actually have a big impact and they can set up the pathway for you obviously to progress to something that is far greater than you are now. You can't expect a white belt to compete like a black belt, you know, after two weeks of, of, of learning how to train and, and learning how to, to um, you know, uh, train their body. It's the same thing, I guess, with diet, with habits and, and that as well. Mm. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I think I'm a big believer in making micro changes, small changes. Most of us, there, there are a, a certain very small percentage of people who can change their lifestyle overnight and then adhere to it long term. But I think, I mean, even outside of diet, just all habits in general, we're so much better as humans to make small changes, little micro changes and get quick wins and get that feedback and then we can start to get momentum and, and as you say you can start to stack those things on top of each other and over time the bigger changes will take place um, but it'll be hopefully much more sustainable for you well I'll, I'll give you a small one this is kind of a bit funny but I've always used milk in my tea so in, in the evening time Tony and I would normally have a cup of tea we would sort of relax for the for the evening and a couple of years ago I switched to using macadamia nut milk um, and at first it was really bizarre and it tasted disgusting and now I can't go back the other way. Um, and it's one of those things that you train your body over a period of time and you get used to things and then you actually start to enjoy things. I, I remember um, first coming off um, using milk um, in, in, in my products and it was it was really, really bizarre. But it's only a small thing and now it's come to something where I literally couldn't go back the other way. But it's what you get used to, yeah. I think as well, like 
that's where a lot of people probably go wrong with plant-based eating, right, Simon? Like you probably agree. I know I've tried to switch to plant-based before. I'm guilty of it. Like what you just said, you just try and like go, okay, Monday morning, I'm just going to start my, you know, my week off and I'm just going to be a hundred percent plant-based. And I think that's where, that's what I loved about your book when I started reading it is just how you, you know, the small changes and even just the 85%, um, you know, window. I think that's such a solid piece of advice for people. Um, because yeah, like that's, I think where a lot of people go wrong. They think they just have to convert their whole diet and just start eating everything plant-based. And then they just get down the route of like, Oh, I just want, just want an egg or I just yeah. want. And <laughs> so, Simon, um, you, you've sort of broken down the book into three parts. Um, I, I particularly liked um, part three and we can sort of maybe break down into that a little bit more. But did you want to sort of give a, a, a synopsis into why you wrote the book? Um, who's, it, who's it for? Uh, and maybe some of the highlights, um, you know, not only in terms of the information in your book, but, but writing the book, what you've learned from it and, and what it means to you. Yeah, sure. I think at the start of of putting sort of pen to paper, I really thought long and hard about whether the world does need another book on nutrition. There are so many out there. And something that was really important to me was providing people with the principles and information to help protect them against misinformation was key was key to writing this so i didn't want to just show how to do it but i wanted to give people those principles which then hopefully stops them feeling like they or or stops them from becoming derailed when the the next media headline surfaces and and they can feel very confident with the the dietary pattern that they choose to adopt and and as i say hopefully that's a life-lasting way of eating for them In the book, I I separate the information into three parts. Part one is diet of confusion. And this really sort of outlines where our current diet is at, where it's going wrong. What are the forces at play that that are leading us to make these decisions? And... You know, it's very important if we look at the the global burden of disease study in 2017 that looked at all risk factors that are contributing to chronic disease and early death, of all risk factors, smoking, alcohol, unsafe sex, bunch of others, the poor diet tops the list. Right. It's the number one contributor to chronic disease and to early death. So this is serious stuff. And if we want to feel better and feel better for longer, then we should want to... to become more educated and informed about the sources of confusion because when we understand the sources of confusion we can then better navigate the world and not be influenced by them so diet diet of confusion is all about that and it's it's everything from the media to the food environment and the food industry and and how all that is curated to to lead to the food choices that we're making food choices today that are seeing you know, 42% of the average Australian's calories are coming from ultra-processed foods. Mm, wow. Crazy. That's, that's something that I think everyone in the nutrition field agrees on we need to change. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Um, and, and so after understanding the, the sources of confusion, then we move into part two, which is diet of science. And we start to look at different diseases that are affecting our community things like cardiovascular disease which we just spoke about we look at cognitive decline we look at type 2 diabetes we look at at longevity and the idea here really is to honor the science and the evidence hierarchy and i explain this that not all science is equal and Mm -hmm. i really tried to to make sure that what i was bringing was scientific consensus so all of the information that's in there is actually is consistent with the major consensus guideline papers, be it the American College of Cardiology or the American College of Endocrinology for for type two diabetes or the American Cancer uh, Guidelines. All of the information is consistent with their, their own guidelines and reviews, which they form by getting committees of usually 10 to 15 people, experts, who all adopt their own different diets and they say to those those groups of people use the evidence hierarchy and come up with the best advice for the public so the that chapter is around clearing some confusion why do certain health professionals see things differently why do we often come across different things online 
Uh, a good example of that is in the cardiovascular disease section, I, re I really try and look at the compared to what, which is such an important question in nutrition science. Mm. When we're, we're trying to ascertain if a food is healthy or not, it's very hard to do that in isolation. Yeah. You have to know what are you comparing it to or what would it be replacing in someone's diet? In addition to dosage and what's their underlying dietary pattern, there are so many things we actually have to think about. And, and often this is, this is left out of media headlines when it becomes quite oversimplified. Uh, so a good example of that is that we know consistently if, if we reduce our saturated fat and our diet down, we, we lower our risk of cardiovascular disease. Now, in saying that, you can go and look at particular studies that show that reduction in saturated fat does not reduce cardiovascular disease. But in those studies, they're comparing it to people who are consuming refined carbohydrates. Mm -hmm. Refined carbohydrates being ultra-processed type mm -hmm. foods, biscuits, cakes, cookies, etc. Mm -hmm. And often that will end up in the media and it's, it's used as a way of of suggesting that foods rich in saturated fat should not be limited. You know, foods like red meat and, and dairy, which can still be part of a healthy dietary pattern, but need to be included in much more modest amounts than the average Australian. But when you look at all of the other science on, on saturated fat, you, you can clearly see that when you replace it with foods rich in unrefined carbohydrates like whole grains or polyunsaturated fats uh, in nuts and seeds and even fish, you see big risk reduction in cardiovascular disease. So it's important to, to understand that different studies are looking at different things. Mm -hmm. And rather than, than making recommendations based on one study, what we have to do is, is first understand that not all science is equal and then come back and look at findings of a particular study within the overall body of research. Mm -hmm. Some of this can sound like it's, it's quite complex, but I really tried to make sure that I was making this information accessible and, and sort of holding the hand of the reader as we go through and clear up some of these things. Yeah, I definitely felt that myself reading it. Like I'm, I wouldn't say I'm a super techie science person with you know my research and everything like that, but yeah, so as a, I would call myself a regular consumer yeah. reading that. Like I so felt, would I. I felt it was really easy to follow and I really got into it and loved it. So. And, and I think it's really important you bring out some really great things. I mean, again, I think you and I, Simon, both agree. In fact, everybody here probably agrees that, that, that getting back to that, you know, nature knows best, yeah. that let food be thy medicine, that there's so much amazing stuff in food, but the way that food is, is processed now, I mean, if, if you look at, you know, the, the, even wheat, the way that it's changed, e even animal husbandry, now we've got mass mega factories creating huge amounts of stress chemicals in the animals, and, and whether, you know, I appreciate, I'm, I'm talking probably to the people that are, look at this and probably go, you know what? Changing to a whole whole food based diet, um, uh, plant based diet is probably a good idea. But I'm not prepared to 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 give up some of these things. I think if you actually objectively look at the information, you can say, well, the amount of stress hormones in our food, um, especially around animals, um, is is actually out of kilter with the way that animal husbandry used to be hundreds of years ago. Uh, and I know, and this leads me on to another question as well too. And I think Elsa, you had a question here, so maybe I'll let you yeah. take it. But oh, no, the, the processed food, like the not dogs, and the, and the other sort of, um, you know, mm. Elsa, I'll let you ask the question because you had some questions around processed foods oh, in, the, in, in the whole f food place market. To know? find out what your thought process is around all of the, like, there's a lot of marketing and there's a lot of hype around all of the, you know, the new fake meats now that are on the market. Um, but that being said, like, you know, they are still really processed. But, you know, some of them, I suppose you can, you can get really good ones. Like, I know there's a lot of pulled mushroom ones and that's like, that's awesome. But what are, what are your it's a great thoughts question. around? It's a really good question. And again, it depends on what someone is, is replacing with those. Yeah. Right. So mm -hmm. if you're if you're eating those instead of eating beans, mm -hmm. then then I think that's a step in, in the wrong direction. Mm -hmm. But 
but most of those products are developed for the average person who's eating you know the super high saturated fat minced meats or burgers yeah. and actually there's a trial that came out last year called the swap meat trial which looked at the they looked at beyond burger yeah mm-hmm. products i was, I was going to ask you about that mm-hmm. and i honestly i asked yeah. that not knowing because i haven't looked into it at all yeah, so they compared, they looked at cardiovascular disease risk factors and they compared some uh, organic meat products that were like for like similar with uh, Beyond Meat products. So, you know, sausages off the shelf with a Beyond versus mm-hmm. a Beyond sausage, hamburger versus a Beyond hamburger. Uh, and they and they did find that even though these plant-based alternatives are processed, they, they did still shift people in the right direction from a cardiovascular disease risk point of view. They tend to be lower in saturated fat. They still are higher in fiber. I think mm-hmm. sodium is an issue in a lot of these. They're, they're depending on the, on the brand, some of them have enormous amounts of sodium. Mm-hmm. So my view on them is that in some circumstances for the average person who's eating a lot of, whether it's deli meats or hot dogs or things like that, mm-hmm. they can be a step in, in, in the right direction. Uh, I don't think they should be the mainstay of someone's diet. I think if we're if we're really wanting to upgrade our health, the science is is quite clear that yes, downshifting on some meat is a great thing, but ideally you're doing that and you're replacing it with whole food sources of plant protein and fiber like beans and lentils and and foods like that that have been studied for a long time and we understand that they offer enormous health benefits. Mm. Mm-hmm. The the um, whole foods, and again, you're a purist as well too. I think like us, um, Simon. As far as local markets, eating fresh, eating local, the, these are things that you advocate, correct? I do. I think local is. I mean, it's great to support local and local community. And uh, you know, I, I'm telling people right now to, to, if they can, buy the book from a local bookstore. Particularly if you're in a country town in Australia that got hit by the the bushfires, as we were talking about off air. So I think local is great from from that angle. I actually do sort of clarify from a planetary health point of view that sometimes the local versus imported conversation can actually distract us mm-hmm. uh, and I know that we're kind of digressing here which to, to planetary health which is still in part two of, of the book it's the final chapter in diet of science uh, but it's very clear that what's on our plate is much more important than where it's traveled from when it comes to the environmental footprint of our meal mm. and that's because the average greenhouse gas footprint of foods that we buy only around 10% of that is from transport. Only around 10% of that is from transport. The, the other 90% is through the, the production and the harvesting mm-hmm. and ultimately it boils down to the type of food and, and what we see and I have a very, very big uh, graph in the book that, that covers this which is from a huge meta-analysis of uh, 119 countries, nearly 40,000 farms that shows the animal products, pretty much every single animal products has a significantly greater greenhouse gas footprint than, than plant foods. So from a planetary health point of view, what's on our plate matters most. Uh, but then, of course, you know, buying local, I think, offers, offers different advantages. The, the main one being that you can support your local community and, and perhaps you can even ask questions and get to understand the farming practices of where your food's coming from. Yeah, I mean, I'm always very cynical, if you like, of the large uh, multinational. Um, you know, I, and I look at companies like Monsanto, which I know have been in, in the in the headlines a lot recently in terms of their, uh, you know, uh, uh, Roundup and and that those chemicals getting into the water table, those chemicals effectively getting into the system, which are completely foreign to. You know, humans. We shouldn't be consuming these things, and and I guess this is where I think people are imagining a better world in terms of ecology. I mean, the amount of plastic that's in the ocean right now is terrifying. If people actually had a look at, uh, you know, uh, the size of Texas, I think is the size of the the the, the plastic that's formed like this mutated island in the middle of the Pacific with these eddies and 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 people are trying to find solutions to that uh, I know that the plastic bags that they first had they worked out that some of them weren't degrading all the way down they're actually creating plastic flakes which actually mm-hmm. were 
you know as bad as the as the original bags that they were trying to create uh you know get rid of um but again this is where you know the mother of of um uh invention is necessity and i think if we're focused on doing that what i'm always concerned about simon um is when large corporations hijack those movements and effectively lead people down a way that the choice looks right but actually isn't sustainable actually isn't good for the planet and specifically isn't good for us as, as humanity so yeah have anything on that <laughs> yeah it's probably more of a statement than a question but um but yeah obviously you're doing a lot of research into what's good for you and what's good for the planet yeah i mean there's a lot there's a lot to unpack in there I, I, i'd agree with what you're saying there i think one of the benefits of getting to know where your food's coming from particularly your fruits and vegetables and all of your produce is if you're for example going to markets you can you can learn about the practices that they're using on their farm. What inputs are they using? Are they doing no tillage and using cover crops and all of this stuff that, you know, some of this stuff, it, it can sound a little overwhelming and, and it depends on where you are with your journey of food. But certainly if you're, if you're trying to learn more and, and want to really get close to where your food's coming from and the impact it has on the environment going to the markets or directly to the farms can be a great way and trying to support you know biodynamic regenerative style practices that are actually nourishing the soil you know versus what you're talking about mm. which is practices that in many ways are are depleting the the, the nutrients in the soil over time yeah absolutely um i, I want to change gear a little bit here because a lot of people especially who are used to especially guys that are training and Simon, you know, you train, uh, you've, you've got a, a good rig, uh, you know, to, to sort of talk about training people that are, that are, that are eating, uh, you know, whole foods, plant-based diet. There's the conception out there or the misconception, and I think Arnold Schwarzenegger and there was another one that, that came out with the documentary, which is trying to shift that norm a little bit, whether you agree or disagree. Talking to you, I know that you're, you're you know, whole foods, plant-based diet, you've created a physique that a lot of guys would want to create. What are some of the advice or the myths that you'd like to dispel for people who are training, athletes, um, and, and what are some of the challenges? I know you talk about B12. Uh, I know yeah. that you say looking and, and looking for um, you know, uh, ingredients that have got a lot of omegas, and you've even got tables in your books in terms of what things to add. So mm. uh, you know, around that whole sort of gambit of sports and, and you know- Misconceptions. Uh, yeah, the, the, the whole misconception of, of performance and, and building muscle tissue. Do you want to sort of speak a little bit to that? Because you do talk about it in your book. Yeah, sure. So part three is all about optimizing a- whole food plant-based diet but equally it might be that someone's just wanting to adopt a more plant-based approach and understanding all of that information in in part three will only give them more confidence and i do tackle some of the the misconceptions that which are these are very valid questions you know as a result of a lot of conditioning and our culture it's very normal to, to hold these ideas. I used to hold them myself. So mm -hmm. I understand what that's like to go through that process and, and have a degree of fear. The, the things that, that I would speak to, I guess, specific to performance and, and, and also uh, noting my personal experience here is one of, the, one of the key differences between a whole food plant-based diet and say an omnivorous diet is calorie density. And as you start to shift and you're downshifting on animal products and eating more whole, whole plants, the calorie density of your diet goes down and so you have to eat more volume. So if your plate has the same amount of volume as, as you would have previously eaten, it will be much lower calories. And if you're trying to train and have enough energy to train and build muscle, you're, you need to eat larger volume. You need to make sure you're consuming enough energy. So energy is is the the first thing that I, I always try to educate on particularly with large guys who have a very high energy requirement who are very active and i know for myself when when i was going through that transition process i wasn't completely aware of that and aware of how many calories i was eating and i was actually under consuming calories a little bit right and it took some time for me to realize i actually needed to eat more volume and then also to focus in on some of the more calorie dense plant foods in my diet in order to satisfy my energy requirements 
So that's the the first thing. So, I think so I on that, just really quickly. Oh, sorry, yeah. go on. What, what were you going to add? Well, well, I think I should add that it's kind of nice that the default of the whole food plant based diet is that it's it's great from a, a weight loss point of view. Yeah, and it I think sounds in, like in, it. it in, in an obesogenic environment, it's quite nice to have the default being uh, under consumption of calories and having to work hard to con- over, to overconsume. I think is favourable in the current sort of um, chronic disease pandemic that we we have. Well, did you have a question on that? No, I'm just saying in terms of the calories. It's funny on your table. I noted something that <clears throat> I absolutely love. I, I'm pretty sure it's native to Australia, but the macadamia nut is probably a great equaliser. Would you say that that's something, especially guys that are absolutely. struggling to get the calories in yeah your nuts and seeds and macadamias are, are a big part of my diet i love them uh but n- nuts and seeds are incredibly calorie dense you can work them into a smoothie to to quite quickly increase your, your total daily energy intake uh so there's a lot of of nuts and nut butters in my diet for sure uh, particularly if i'm trying to gain weight and actually put on size uh the the next thing that i would would usually educate on is protein because it is such a common question yeah. and rightly so because protein is very important from uh, performance recovery and muscle protein synthesis and uh, it's, it's important that we're getting enough and that where it's bioavailable and where our body is able to use it all of that sort of stuff so I in the book I go through the the fact that all plants actually contain all nine essential amino acids and and that sometimes surprises people and and it's often uh it's even surprises me i I used to actually hold the idea that quinoa and soy were for example the complete proteins the only ones with the all nine essential amino acids which in fact is is not correct every single plant contains all nine essential amino acids they're just in different ratios Mm. and the definition of an incomplete protein does not actually mean that it is missing any of the nine essential amino acids. It just means that one of the amino acids is what is described as a limiting amino acid. And what that means essentially is if Jeff only ate black beans all day for all of his calories, he would fall short on the daily requirement of cysteine, for example, or methionine which is one uh, amino acid. So that definition of, of a limiting amino acid and an incomplete protein is really important for developing countries where people may live on one food. Yeah. But mm-hmm. let's be honest, in developed countries, not many people are doing that where they're ha- eating all of their 2,000 calories or 2,500 calories, f- for example, from white rice. Mm-hmm. That that doesn't happen in developed countries, uh, or if it does, it's it's very rare and very unfortunate. Yeah. So, so when you eat with just modest diversity, basic modest diversity, much less diversity than I would encourage people to eat with, you consume all nine essential amino acids in the required amounts, providing you're eating enough calories to to to, to suit your body's daily energy requirements. Well, so that's the that's the first thing that I really try to explain in the book is that the the idea that you have to combine proteins or that certain plants are missing essential amino acids is a very old school way of thinking, and it's mm-hmm. not actually backed by science. And um, you know, all the references are in the book. There you can look. There's a two, 2019 paper by Christopher Gardner, who's probably one of the leading researchers in nutrition science in the world at Stanford Uni, and he wrote a great paper on this um, that summarizes all of it. The The next question is about bioavailability. Usually that comes up and uh, is animal protein more bioavailable than, than plant protein? And I would say that in, in short, animal protein is a little bit more bioavailable based on what we know today. But it has been overstated and and the reason it's been overstated is that the studies we've used to compare bioavailability there there are two main scoring systems the ds and the pdcas and the the ds has been mainly used using uh, animal models using rats and they have a very dig- different digestive system to humans. Hmm. The PDCAS has been used in pigs who do have a better, a more closer digestive system to humans. 
but the 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 problem with these earlier studies that use these models is that they were feeding the pigs raw plant protein so feeding them raw legumes right. for example so the results are somewhat questionable because we understand that if you eat a raw legume like a raw bean or a lentil we know that that protein is not bioavailable mm -hmm. and we know that you have to soak and cook those foods in order for the nutrients to become available so the the recent studies that are coming out in the in the last few years that are actually now looking at humans suggest that it may only be a few percent different depending on the type of plant protein but in the book i recommend allowing sort of as an insurance policy a 10 percent uh extra allowance if you are a completely whole food plant-based uh dieter so that what i mean by that is we know that you need about 1.6 grams per kilogram of yep. body weight at least if you're trying to optimize for muscle protein synthesis i think if you are getting that all from plants exclusively until we have more research i would be adding a, a sort of a buffer of about 10 percent on top of that taking it to around 1.8 grams per kilo as a minimum target level mm -hmm. if you're an athlete and you're really wanting to sort of optimize muscle protein synthesis and and lean muscle i, I know in your book as well too <clears throat> One of the things you talk about specifically is the quest for leucine because it's probably something that you get asked a lot for. Um, so, you know, in terms of the importance of leucine, um, I know um, there are certain people that have done their PhDs on it and they talk about, you know, how important leucine is. Where do you see leucine and how do you get enough and, and what foods do you recommend? So I, I'd say... I mean, the research is pretty clear that leucine is an important amino acid and there's a leucine threshold. Uh, I think that research is is pretty sound and a lot of that's been done by guys like Lane Norton yep. who speaks about this all the time and he's done some great work and really contributed well to the, to the science. Uh, I, in terms of whole plant foods, there's, there is a table in the book and I, and I also show a day of eating or a, a meal, sorry, to get 40 grams of protein and to hit the leucine threshold. Leucine in plant foods tends to be uh, richest in, in soy type uh, products, be it edamame or tofu or tempeh. So that's where you're going to find your, most of your leucine. Interestingly, and this is a, a, a great discussion to have with ATP science, there is a lot of leucine in potato protein. Mm. and potato protein isolate. So I'm not, I, I'm not aware of any companies around the world that are using that as a plant-based ingredient to provide a protein powder that has a really good leucine profile, but I'm waiting for a company, mm. uh, nudge, nudge, to, uh, to, <laughs> to, can, to can at I, least... Can I, let, let me tell you something really it. funny. After reading that in the book, I rang up our <laughs> department and I oh, said, I? yeah, I'm serious. <laughs> and I said, um, okay, because I mean, again, Simon, this is about education. So please, people, this is not a product flow because I appreciate you do use supplements but again we still believe as well too that the bulk of your nutrients should be coming from your food so yeah. listen let me just say that as a disclaimer but we know from a convenience point of view specifically on having days and you say in your book as well too it's a good idea to look at supplements mm. especially if you're on the go and what have you so we have had a quest to produce a plant-based um, protein for years and we constantly get asked for it. Um, we, we came out with the, the vegan aminos, which is all plant-based aminos in the right ratios, which is a great product. Yeah, I love it. I love that product. Mm. Um, but we know that people wanted to to get have a protein, something that they could add into smoothies. It was a little bit more food as opposed to sort of specific amino acids as a, you know, as a sports product. And we've got one. And I think it's the best in the world. I, it, because the biggest things for us was we wanted something that was gut right friendly. So we wanted to remove legumes. When people are doing the gut right diet, we appreciate, we don't recommend that all the time and that legumes should make up part of your diet. But when people are doing, you know, gut right challenges, the 10 day, you know, reset. So it had to be friendly with that. The second thing was, is it had to taste good and not be chalky. Now we've done that. Now we did look at everything and we included looking at the potato protein as well too. And, and we're going to revisit that because I know what you're saying. What, what the feedback was is that uh, it tasted terrible. <laughs> it was difficult to mask the, 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 the taste yeah. and what have you. But 
I'm actually going to relook at it, and we're actually going to relook at the the potato, bar, um, you know, uh, protein, and see if we can't do something to actually uh, get rid of that. But we do have a protein coming out, and I'll let you have a try of it, and I'll actually get the, the macros for you. But yes, I do agree with you. Potato is a fantastic source of of um, of branch chain amino acids. I think the best in the plant base that we could find. Yeah, well, I look forward to, to trying that. I'm sure you guys have done a great job with it. Uh, but as you say, I'm, I, I have a whole a sort of whole food uh, approach. But I think if you're an athlete and you have higher uh, energy requirements and demands on your body, then supp- there, are, there are smart supplements mm. that you can add in that make life so much easier and they also help you achieve your goals. So I have nothing against supplements. I just think they, they are a tool and should really complement uh, a really healthy diet at the end of the day. Yeah, Definitely and look, as a supplement like company, food. we actually agree the same way. We, we, and I know that that's funny, but we, we we know that there's so much missing out there in terms of people's nutritional, um, you know, profiles, and and sometimes a supplement can be of, of benefit. But it's like anything. You, you don't put a roof on a house without walls. You, you've got to have the foundation. You've got to have the walls. And then when you've done everything that you can, then the supplementation can, can make the difference. It's never a magic bullet. It's always a, a, a supplement <laughs> to, your, to, to your foundation diet. So, yeah, that's good. Elsa, have, have you got any questions that we, we haven't asked? No, I think um, the other uh, misconception, I know you touched on uh, protein, I know a lot of people always go on about iron yes, and um, like your, B, your B12s. And I know that mm. you touch on that in the book. Um, do you just want to share with us, you know, a little bit yeah, about so that? In, in part three, there's eight principles that I, that I go through that I think are, are important learnings for someone that wants to set up mm. a healthy dietary pattern. And one of those is nutrients of focus. So all dietary patterns really have nutrients of focus. Some of them are are nutrients that perhaps we're getting too much of, for example, saturated fat or trans fats. Yeah. Uh, and in, in, the, in the case of more plant-based approaches, there are, what I want the reader to understand is that there are, yes, these enormous health benefits up for grabs with regards to cardiovascular disease and lifestyle disease, diseases. But at the same time, as you're changing your diet up, you want to be really conscious of particular micronutrients, making sure you're getting those in adequate amounts. That's going to ensure on a day-to-day you're feeling vibrant, your energy levels are good, your hormone levels are good, all of that stuff. It's very important that we do take the time to take some of this information on board. And it's all quite simply addressed it's about setting up some routine and some habits but first you need to understand uh, what those nutrients are and and how you can access them so in principle four nutrients of focus i I go through eight nutrients that i want people to to know why they're important where you can get them from and then they can set up their routine and those are omega-3s so really uh, ala but also dha and epa so in there i talk about the, the various sources of plant-based omega-3s and then why someone may want to consider an algae oil, which is a direct source of DHA and mm. and EPA. Of course, vitamin B12, there's vitamin D3, which really I think uh, no matter what dietary pattern you follow, particularly if you're in northern latitudes, something that you should look at. Uh, look at calcium, iodine, selenium, and zinc and iron, as you said. So perhaps if we, if I just zoom in on iron to, to save going through all of those, <laughs> iron is iron deficiency is the number one deficiency in the world, oh, uh, and and actually, yeah, it's it's the most common deficiency, and and actually there is a little bit of a myth that vegetarians and vegans are more likely to be deficient in iron. That's true in the developing countries absolutely and that's because the vegetarians and vegans often in these developing countries are from lower socioeconomic classes their diet is really can sometimes be one or two foods grains only and and so their their motive to adopt a vegetarian or vegan diet is a little different to someone in the developed country they're in completely different circumstances in the in developed countries vegetarians and vegans are not at higher risk of of iron um, deficiency however they do have lower iron stores 
but there's no science right now to suggest that having lower iron stores is a deficiency as long as your diet through food or through supplementation is providing enough iron on a daily weekly basis to top up your uh, iron serum levels so in that section of the book i i speak to the importance of regularly including iron rich plant foods in your diet and for many people that's enough if someone is struggling with iron then then the working with their doctor they they will need to depending on where their levels are at they may need to take a supplement or they may be able to improve their iron levels through focusing on inhibitors and enhancers which are parts of our diet that help increase or decrease absorption so there are there are components of food like vitamin c for example when we eat vitamin c rich foods that will increase the absorption of iron in our meals when we uh when we add garlic and onion to our food that will also increase the absorption of, of iron in our meals so there are some tools there and then there are also things that can inhibit absorption like calcium for example mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. Again, this this is stuff to think about if you're having problems with iron. Mm-hmm. But for the for the person who has no no problems at all, I don't even want them to to think about this. It's too complex. Just eating with diversity and including iron rich foods is all that person needs to focus on. Uh, so that's that's my summary for iron. But uh, yeah, as I said, if if uh, if you read through the book, you'll get a summary on all of those nutrients and, and by the end, r- realize whether you need to supplement or what foods you can access them from. It's funny, when Matt was talking with some, I can't remember who exactly, but somebody following a plant-based, I can't remember if they were vegan or just vegetarian, I think it must have been vegan, that they were look complaining about um, getting Amigas, which is part of the philosophy originally where he created the uh, golden oil because that's actually omega-3, 5, 6, 7, and 9, and it's all plant-based. And we do a terrible job of actually marketing that product because it's such a, a, a – and it's got turmeric in there as well too. But um, yeah, I, and I appreciate it. Again, these are things where uh, if people are doing everything that they can. They can always obviously look for a supplement. And again, is it from whole food sources? Is it natural? Which is, again, what ATP Science stands for. The um, other thing I had to ask you, and I want to circle back around too – Pomegranates is one of my absolutely favorite. I consider it to be a miracle fruit. And and with people with um, history of you know heart uh, disease, um, the we did a podcast on it a while ago. I don't know if you've, you've heard it, Simon, but uh, do you use pomegranate? Do you talk about um, – does your father use pomegranate? Do you, do you talk to people about the benefits of food as, as medicine, specifically around uh, you know heart health? Well, I think – I mean, pomegranate, like many fruits, has a lot of very powerful plant compounds. Uh, there's some interesting uh, companies using uh, pomegranate oil now, which is very rich in polyphenols, yeah. mm. like uh, like olive oil. Uh, and and these, I mean, the we could talk an hour about fiber and polyphenols, but <laughs> these yeah. these polyphenols, which you've probably spoken about a number of times on your show, I'm sure, particularly with the the gut right product, they the polyphenols act as food as well. They're prebiotic in nature, and and these healthy gut bugs will will feed on them. And 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 as we're feeding those particular gut bugs out of the trillions that we have, uh, they reward us, and they reward us through the the production of of various uh, molecules like short chain fatty acids, which lower inflammation and help keep our our uh, intestinal tract in good order and and um, the gut lining order, and also then downstream, uh, help protect us against cardiovascular disease, like you just said before. Um, through lowering inf- inflammation, we, I mean, there, there, there is believed to be an effect on on our brain, it may even impact our mood, things like depression, uh, our our risk factor, f- our risk for cognitive decline. So, yes, I think pomegranate is a great food. Uh, it contains a lot of incredible antioxidants and, and plant compounds and um, certainly I would encourage people to add it in along with a very diverse range of, of other fruits and vegetables. I like that you say that in your book as well too because it's something that's always sat 
as a juxtaposition for me growing up, starting in the industry in 2002, being around people that were fascinated with, you know, dropping weight and being as muscular as possible. And fruit was on the no-no list. And I always, you know, as a relatively nature aspiring sort of person, understanding that God created all these natural foods and fruits for our benefit, I, I could never really wrap my head around abstaining from, you know, apples and berries. And, and it's nice to see in your book as well, too, talking about the difference between refined sugars and the sugars you find in, in fruit with the polyphenols, the fibers and everything else. And that I think you even said, and again, I don't want to give away too much in your book, but there's some really interesting research there in terms of the impact on uh, body fat levels and consuming fruit. Um, and, and, and again, I think the more that we get back to a whole, f- uh, you know, whole food, uh, you know, uh, and these wonderful plants and not taking them out of our diet because they don't fit with our macros. It's, it's one of the things that really does my head in because you might look fantastically healthy on the outside, but the long term devastation to your insides and your longevity, I think, is, is at risk. Yeah, and that's I, I do cover that under at the start of the book when I talk about nutritionism which I think has somewhat distracted us. You know, looking, at, looking at carbohydrates, protein, and fat does have its place. But what happens is, to the point you just made then, when we just think about carbohydrates, that's an umbrella term, and there are different types of carbohydrates. And mm-hmm. what's most important is the, the food, the source of those carbohydrates, because that determines what's coming along for the ride. And if we're getting our carbohydrates from ultra-processed packaged foods, we've had water stripped out, we've had fiber stripped out, we've had heaps of these phytochemicals, these, these plant compounds that we're talking about here, uh, polyphenols as an, as an example, that have been stripped away. So when we focus on the food groups and we're getting our carbohydrates from fruits, from vegetables, from whole grains and from legumes, foods like those, we, we're getting so much more than just the carbohydrate and the four calories that come with that. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Well, let's circle back. I just wanted to touch on those um, eight plant-proof pr- principles that you have sure. in part three because I feel like they, I mean, I just, uh, like, I thought that was some really, really great resonate. tips. Yep. And I think a lot of people, like I said at the start of the episode, like a mm. lot of people are a bit stuck on where to start. Yep. So to summarize the, the, the eight principles, which are in the part three, which is called Making the Shift, that's the practical part of the book. The, the first principle is focus on food groups, not macronutrients. And, and as I just explained, when we do that, we, we, are, we are improving our diet quality immediately. When we're focusing on making fruits and vegetables, whole grains, legumes, nuts and seeds in their sort of minimally or, uh, or whole uh, forms, minimally, minimally processed or whole forms, we're shifting our diet towards a dietary pattern that is known to help prevent various chronic diseases and improve our longevity and again it's not about an all or nothing approach you find that level of commitment that works for you but making those foods the foundation of the diet and i think for the average australian it's around rethinking what's the hero of the plate and rather than animal protein being the hero of the plate and all of these whole plant foods the afterthought just flipping that on its head a bit the second principle is to be fiber obsessed and protein aware. The average Australian is consuming a fiber deficient diet. Um, fiber reduces our risk of, of many of these chronic diseases and, and we want people aiming for at least 28 grams of fiber a day if you're a woman or 38 grams a day if you're a man, hopefully even more than that. The third principle is diversity is key for gut health. Mm diversity is key for gut health and again you would have spoken about this i'm sure on the show many times but different different species of bacteria in our gut who we have a very symbiotic relationship with they have different taste preferences just like we do and the fiber that exists in broccoli is different to that found in asparagus is different to that found in onions and when we have a diverse range of plants lots of different colors we're making sure we're keeping these different species nice and strong and and as they are kept strong they reward us both locally in the gut with good gut health and downstream 
principle four is consider nutrients of focus. We spoke about that. That's making sure that your diet is appropriately planned and you are getting all of the, the various uh, nutrients like omega-3s and other micronutrients that will allow you to experience the full benefit of a plant-based approach. Principle five is when we eat matters, not just what we eat. And this is a very interesting area of emerging research, but there, there is enough there to give us some guidance now, I mm -hmm. think, within reason. And really, chrononutrition is looking at our, our, our circadian rhythms and our body's natural clock. And then how can we, how can we really nurture that? And I think the easiest way of, of explaining this is that we have daily fluctuations in physiological processes. Like, for example... Uh, our hormone levels are going up and down throughout the day. And this is preparing us for what's to come. So like when we wake up in the morning, melatonin drops and cortisol increases, and that's getting us ready to get active. Whereas at night, melatonin starts to increase and cortisol comes down, and that's getting us ready for hopefully a restful sleep. And what's important is that these, these physiological rhythms are affected by external cues. And the two main external cues are light, light exposure, which is why late at night we don't want a whole lot of light exposure because it can, can dampen the melatonin release and, and keep cortisol high, which then affects our ability to sleep, but also meal timing. And there is quite a lot of research showing now that ideally we, we want to be eating within, say, a 12-hour window. Most, most people are eating for 15, 16 hours a day, mm -hmm. which is eating as soon as you wake up to as soon as you go to bed. So I've, I, I put forward what I, what I believe is a, is a reasonable starting point for people to, to nurture their circadian rhythms through meal timing, which is eating within that sort of 10 or 12 hour window, which I think is achievable for most people. Mm -hmm. So that could look like if you wake up at, at 6 a.m., your first meal could be at 8 a.m., and then your last meal would be at 8 p.m. With, with at least a couple of hours, ideally, with no food before you go to bed. Mm -hmm. And the research shows that when we, when we do that, there are benefits up for grabs like increased energy levels, healthier body weight, improved mood, and also, also our, our uh, markers of chronic disease risk tend to move in a more favorable direction. Things like blood sh uh, sugar control, um, and, and other uh, hormone levels. Principle six is drink water for thirst. I think water is, is the most underrated superfood and, and most of us could be a little more conscious of how much water we're drinking. I always say that it's not about a set number of glasses. I think the best indicator is, is, your, is your urine clear to straw color. And, and if it is, you know you're hydrated for your body size and your activity level. So keeping an eye on that. Principle seven is customization is key. So I can give the framework and the characteristics of a healthy diet, but there is some individuality between people. And I want, I want people to follow how they feel, how their body feels and follow their taste buds and adapt to a plant-based approach that works for them and has them feeling the best. And principle eight, which is the final one, which we, we did speak about uh, at the start, which is don't let perfection be the enemy of good. We want life lasting changes and consistency over time matters far more than what you eat in a particular day. Yeah, excellent. Awesome. That's great. Yeah, they're really good. I've got a couple more questions. Okay, yeah, go for it. Just because I feel like I know that you said you don't like talking about um, what you necessarily eat. It's more so what, you know, other people can do for themselves. But people are nosy. So what does a, like a, pretty much a day of new, like food look like for you, day on a plate? I usually start most mornings with oats. So mm -hmm. soaked oats overnight. I tend to soak those in soy milk. And they will be topped with... Uh, chia seeds, flax seeds, they're rich in omega-3s, uh, walnuts, and then lots of berries. I love berries. I speak in the book about the cognitive benefits up for grabs with berries. Mm. There was a, a randomized controlled trial out in 2019 that looked at a placebo smoothie versus a berry smoothie. 
and they matched them for energy and sugar to make sure that that wasn't going to be the, the, the variable or responsible for the effect. So the only difference was that one contained the berries with all of the anthocyanins and these polyphenols. Mm -hmm. And they found that those having the berry smoothie experienced significantly less cognitive fatigue over the following six hours. Wow. So their brains were operating better. So I'm, I'm big on starting the day with some berries in, on the oats. What berries specifically uh, do you like? I mean, I like blueberries. Uh, exactly. What else What else do you go for? I, I love blueberries, uh, but I do try and, and, and mix it up within reason, but I, I tend to find blueberries are my favorite as well. Yep. Uh, Snack-wise, uh, depending on, on sort of what my day of activity is looking like, my, some of my quick go-tos are like uh, a, a whole wheat sourdough with peanut butter and banana as a snack on top of it, very basic. I think sometimes Instagram can make it look like people's diets are, are quite lavish, but mm. we've all got our very simple go-tos. Yep. Um, so that's something for like a quick, quick energy fix or, or a handful of dates or something like that. Um, I do I do quite a few smoothies. I find the smoothies allow me to get a lot of calories in that that allow me to achieve my sort of calorie requirements. Uh, lunch is usually probably the biggest meal of my day, and dinner is a little bit lighter. So lunch is a very big bowl that will have some form of of whole grain in there, quinoa or something like that. A lot of a lot of dark leafy greens usually in that meal, some tofu and lentils, foods like that, uh, and then you know hopefully some some cruciferous vegetables like broccolini or broccoli. All of this is spiced and seasoned. Mm -hmm. I think uh, that's a key to to remember that as we're eating more of these foods, often we forget what brings the flavour, and and so I I try and uh, get people to imagine if you just pulled a piece of chicken out of a packaging and you didn't do anything with it no oils no herbs no spices or marinade it wouldn't taste that amazing mm. and it's a similar process with tofu tofu will be very bland on its own and a lot of people find legumes quite bland you you need to to work in your favorite flavors and and herbs and spices and condiments are really what's going to bring that experience uh so that's like a, a a Buddha bowl, I guess you would you would call it. And then dinner, again, could be a variation of that, or could be a curry or uh, spaghetti bolognese. Again, when I was initially doing my my own transition, one of the things that I found was really easy was rather than being overwhelmed by all of these crazy recipes out there, what are my staples throughout the week? One of those was spaghetti bolognese. How can I make that plant based with uh, as simply as possible and it was to basically keep all of the ingredients the same except for swap the mincemeat out for I, I found a recipe online that 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 showed me how to use lentils mushrooms and walnuts to create mm. a plant-based mince nice. and a few spices uh, and then that became a household staple for me uh, so these are the kind of foods that I tend to to eat and then I'm just adjusting the volume and the size of those meals based on on how much activity I'm doing. And I, I, I don't count calories, but I have a fairly good idea of, of looking at understanding how much protein I'm eating is usually a good indicator for me. I can kind of eyeball it. And as we spoke about before with supplements, I tend to, to throw in at least a, a protein shake a day, which helps me hit that, the, the level of protein intake that uh, is, is optimal. Perfect. And just quickly, because I know people go, what spices is he using? I mean, are there any sort of th ones that you could throw out there for sort of give people yeah, a bit favorites. of a heads up? Yeah. Okay. So when I cook, I actually, a little bit of olive oil and uh, garlic and onion usually go into the, the pan first, pretty much everything I make. Uh, and and then the, the spices that are, that are regular for me are cumin, uh, paprika, so sweet or smoked paprika uh, and turmeric. Mm. Those are the ones that, that I would use quite regularly on rotation. And then some of the other things that I use to bring in flavor are tamari. Mm -hmm. uh, the nutritional yeast will, will help bring in a bit of a cheesy flavor if that's what you're looking for. 
Um, but I think the, 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 the most important thing is understanding that because sometimes people get worried about flavor. They think, oh, plant-based food will be bland. And if you get the texture right, you can actually deliver a very, very similar experience, if not better in many cases. And I say that like if you think about uh, Japanese food and you think about a sushi roll, mm. the, 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 the piece of salmon that's in there is not bringing a, a whole lot of flavor. A lot of the flavor in that is your seaweed, your soy sauce, the ginger and the wasabi. Mm. And so if you can, if you can work with those four and then bring in something that has a texture similar to fish, like a piece of uh, a, a, a cutting of a mango or avocado, you can actually have a very similar experience. And so it is just coming back to the flavors that you love to cook with now and, and working with those just with plant-based foods. Hmm. Love it. That's awesome. Yeah, that's really good. Last question. Yep. And you might, I don't know if you'll know the answer to this one, but what's one question, because I'd assume you get asked a lot of questions, that you wish you got asked more? One question that I get asked that I wish I get asked more. Or a, yeah, a question you wish that you got asked more. What's the gold that people need to hear that they're just not asking? Mm-hmm. What, what, what's sort of like the, the, the thing that really made a big difference to you that you'd, you'd sort of tell everybody else that you think is, is, a, is a really good I, I, good I think it would be why, and this is, is usually from, from younger people who are in good health, why, why should I make these changes today mm-hmm. when I feel good? Mm-hmm. And, and I, I encourage people... Usually people are, are motivated to make changes to their diet when they've experienced something with their health or someone in their family has. Now, if I'm speaking to someone who has not, that's the challenge for me mm. is how do I instill a why for that person to motivate them to want to take control of their health when for all intents and purposes, they feel healthy and everything's tracking along well. Mm-hmm. And what I like to explain to them is that these chronic diseases bubble away under the surface they have a very long latency period but they do catch up on us they do catch up on us and if we do the same thing as everyone else we can't expect to have different results if we're living the same standard australian lifestyle and eating the same diet as everyone else then from a risk point of view and from a probability point of view it is highly probable we will follow their their journey and so this is about risk reduction. It's about doing what you can so that you feel better for longer. And don't wait for pain to be the motivator. Mm. Don't wait for that moment, that thing to happen in your life when you, you go, damn, I wish I looked at this 10, 20 years ago. I wish I made some changes. And then I would add to that that the great thing is you don't have to sacrifice anything. It seems like it's a big sacrifice to adopt a more plant-based approach and I totally get that. But I can tell you from my personal experience, what you gain is far more than what you leave behind. Mm. So if, you're, if you are motivated by staying in good health and you want to be healthier for longer, then yeah, I just implore you to, to get across the information find a level of commitment that works for you and and start nudging your diet in a way that we know is associated with better health, better health outcomes than the average Australian. Talking about the average Australian, I know one of the questions, and you say in your book as well too, to limit alcohol intake. If you're going to uh, partake of alcohol, is it the red wine or, um, and is it, you know, um, a glass a day is it I mean and again you might not drink at all Simon I don't know how do you look at alcohol I do have the I do have the the odd glass of red wine mm-hmm. so I, I I would say I don't binge drink and if I drink it's it's uh, with friends and with a meal is when I would drink these days I think the research is fairly clear from a cancer point of view that alcohol is considered a, carc- a carcinogen mm-hmm. and increases the risk of, of various cancers there is research that suggests that one or two uh, alcoholic beverages a day decreases the risk of dementia. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's mm-hmm. that's interesting. Mm. And then the blue zones, which are these sort of longevity areas of the world where 
the, the highest number of centenarians in the world. Not all of them, but four out of the five zones do drink a little bit of alcohol regularly and in a setting where it is with a meal and it is a social thing. Yeah. So my, my message is if someone doesn't drink alcohol, my message to them is not to start. <laughs> but if you do drink, if you do drink alcohol, I think, think, it, think about that, that, that these, these areas that are showing good health, when they are drinking, it's not, it's not binge drinking. They're not drinking on their own. It's with a meal. And it's usually, you know, one or two two glasses per day. So it's not excessive drinking. I think in Australia we certainly do have a culture of excessive drinking and binge drinking, um, and and certainly that's something that we can we can work on. Not just from from the actual alcohol point of view, but also it's a great contributor to excess calories. Yeah and to to obesity and i and i write about that in the book and it's not just that the alcohol and the drink contains the the calories it's that usually it leads to a day afterwards of overconsumption of calories mm-hmm. and that's less energy expenditure yeah so a there's point. a sort of there's a twofold effect of regularly consuming a lot of alcohol and and the thing i like about red wine if that is your drink of of purposes typically it it, it doesn't contain sugar it does have the mm-hmm. The polyphenols, uh, proanthocyanidins from the grape seed, um, resveratrol. I know that there's some question marks around that, but the the nice thing about it is that um, uh, with regards to one or two, as you say, any more than that, there's and I know that we did a podcast on it. There's a significant impact on your hormone ratio, specifically testosterone and estrogen as well too. So again, it's one of those things. Moderation is the key. Um, and and uh, it doesn't mean you have to cut it out completely if you enjoy that, but um, you've got to look at the impact uh, of why you're drinking and and you know are you are you overindulging because anything in overabundance can create a problem. So yeah, yeah, and 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 I think it also depends on what your overall health is. If 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 your health is not great, and for example, you're struggling to sleep and you feel really tired, I know, and 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 many people. Uh, have spoken about this when when I have even just a couple of glasses of red wine my sleep is nowhere near as good quality and, you know the the devices that I that I measure and we could talk all day about how accurate they are they suggest my deep sleep isn't isn't as deep my uh, recovery is not as good so yeah recovery there you know I think yeah I, I think it co- comes down to to personal circumstance how healthy are you how are you consuming it you know all of these things and then if you're not feeling that great it might be something that you want to experiment excluding for a while and see how you respond we we interviewed the um inventor of the whoop watch and he was talking specifically about some of the research that he was doing on recovery for for athletes after consuming alcohol and I, and I think back to the eighties, nineties, even even now with you know you look at these professional AFL and and rugby and NFL teams and all the rest of it, and the amount of alcohol that they consume um, post workout, especially back in the eighties and nineties, oh yeah. my gosh! I mean, like the 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 impairment that they're doing for their recovery, the the impact that they're having on their career. Um, I mean, and again, not just for the professional athletes, for everybody, if you want to be performing at your best, is absolutely huge mm. once you go over that two glasses of, um, of uh, specifically alcohol, but, but, but anything really. Yeah. yeah, it would be nice to see some, some more education, I think, on binge drinking, particularly in, in Australia with younger kids. Yeah. I think it's a, the culture here, it's incredibly hard. If you wanted to, to go through high school and university and not be a drinker, it's 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 hard from a social point of view there is a lot of peer pressure mm-hmm. and you know it's certainly it's a it's a topic that i'd like to see you know more uh, activism and more discussion about in general just to to raise the awareness on that a bit and and maybe part of that is definitely fear does motivate but for a lot of people it's performance you know especially if you've got young athletes yeah. or, or or people you can talk about the uh, the benefits of, of of not so i guess it's that balanced approach yeah i think that's a great point um, all right well congratulations simon i just wanted to say, yeah, mate, say that well done how long, <laughs> mate, just how long did it take you to write it took me about i'd say three years of actual writing wow uh, 
you know, a, d- a decade or more of, of reading the science. But yeah, from when I first put pen to paper, probably a three year process. I think, when was it that I was up on the Gold Coast? That mm. was November. I know it's November. Ago. I think it was pre COVID, so what, 2019. Wow. Yeah, that was 2019. Yeah, wow. And then I was on your show probably earlier that year. Yep. So I think, you know, around that time, me being on the show, I probably had started writing around mm-hmm. that time. So, um, yeah, it's time's flown, hasn't it? It's it really been great has. to connect with you guys again. I, I'm a big fan of everything that you do. I love the content that you're putting out and, and the products. So, mm, likewise. yeah, I really, really appreciate all of your support. No, absolutely, and and Tony, Elsa said it likewise as well. But I know that we're going to give away a couple. Yeah, of Yeah, we've the got books. a couple. I mean, you took home two. I've copies. got them. I've got them. I've got them back. I've bought them back. <laughs> Great, um, awesome. Yes, personally we have autographed two by me. No, I'm, I'm kidding. No, they've got my personal dog ears on them and my lick and my spit. Simon, yeah, I'm kidding, tell I'm everybody, tell the audience where they can find your book um, and find you as well online. Cool. So the book is The Proof is in the Plants Mm -hmm. and you can find it on Booktopia or any other online uh, retailer like Dimmix or Readings. You can find it in every bookstore across Australia, I'm told. Uh, Again, if you have a favorite local bookstore, go and go and support them. Mm -hmm. Uh, And you can find me on on Instagram at plant underscore proof. I'm quite active on there and would love to connect. So if you have any questions or or whatnot, please uh, reach out. Perfect. Awesome. Thanks so much for joining us, Simon. Yeah, good to, good to see you again, mate, and best wishes with the book. And, mate, I will get you back to talk more about business because <laughs> I know yes, I sort of wanted to talk it. to you about it, but um, maybe we'll let you needs get the – It needs its own. Well, and, 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 you know, maybe we can circle back after the book's been popular, uh, you know, out there for a while and, and we can reconnect at another time. But, um, mate, well, well done and congratulations. It's such a Thanks, mammoth guys. undertaking. Yeah. Thank you, guys. I appreciate nice. you. All right, thanks. You too. Thanks, Simon.